It's time for the Biblical Prophecy Program with your host, Dr. Alan Kirshner of Eschatos Ministries. Hey, welcome back everyone to another episode of the Biblical Prophecy Program. So in this episode, uh, I have a, a big announcement. Uh, this is turning into an audio and video podcast. So I've done 106, 167 episodes of the Biblical Prophecy Program, and they have all been audio. Well, I'm bringing in a, you know, a video component to the podcast. So you can watch this on YouTube. You can go to alankirshner.com and uh, click on the YouTube link and subscribe to the program, or you can just go to uh, my channel, my YouTube channel. I uh, will be incorporating other elements of video into the into the uh, the uh, the podcast. Of course, if you can continue to to listen to this audio, uh, so it, the the audio is going to be the exact same for the video and for the audio component. Okay, so this question of the uh, of the the topic of this episode is the great multitude in Revelation seven. Chapter 7, verses 9 through 17, located in heaven or earth. I know for some of you it might be kind of an obvious answer. Yeah, it's located in heaven. It's a heavenly scene. Uh, you know, what has changed from Revelation chapter 4 and 5, right? I mean, Revelation chapter 4 and 5 was a heavenly scene. You have this same heavenly scene in uh, Revelation chapter 7. So, what? you know, what? why would it change? Why would it be on earth? Well, let me let me uh, back up and give you some theological context. Uh, so, uh, all millennialists and post tribulationists, and again, there's there's overlap. Some uh, many all millennialists are are post trib and vice versa. And but there's a lot of post tribs who are not um, uh, all millennial. Many are are pre millennial. And you have to understand that all millennialists and post tribulationists they come from what what I call a simple eschatology uh, versus a complex eschatology uh, hermeneutic. And I don't mean in terms of grasping or cognitively simple or complex. I'm talking about how things unfold. Okay, so when we, for example, if, if we, when we think of Christ's first coming, we don't think of a simple event like, okay, he was born. And, and that exhausted his entire first coming. No, of course not. It was a complex first coming of Christ. Uh, his birth, his, you know, his growing up, his ministry, death, burial, resurrection. It, you know, his first coming, it lasted over 30 years. Uh, and, well, when people approach studying the second coming of Christ, a fundamental hermeneutic that they use is the... Uh, tend to be uh it's it, what again what i would call a an as a special way of looking at the second coming you can look at it in a simple word sense that is uh, what post trips and all millennials when they approach these you know esch eschatological texts they approach it in terms of of well when christ comes back they conceive of it as some simple event like overstate it just a little bit but it's like you know Christ comes at, comes back bam you know one day or one moment you know everything's been fulfilled and and we're you know we're ushered into uh you know the millennium or we're immediately ushered into the eternal state uh so they don't see that unfortunately they don't see God's manifold purposes when Jesus returns uh I believe in uh, my hermeneutic is a complex, po complex eschatology. God is go going to fulfill many divine purposes when Jesus returns. So the beginning of the uh, parousia, he begins to fulfill a number of events. I mean, you've got the be well, the, the beginning events, of course, are deliverance events. Uh, you have the 144,000 being sealed. You have the, uh, the, uh, the remnant of Israel. 
you have the resurrection, you have the rapture. And then subsequent to that will be the day of the Lord's wrath, a complexity of judgments. Listen, Jesus is coming back to be glorified in his judgment. It's not going to be a poof, you know, and the world is going to look around and go, oh, what, what happened? You know, and somehow they're, in, and then the very next second or the very next hour, somehow they're in hell. That's not what's going to happen. Christ is going to be glorified. He's going to be glorified in trumpet judgments and bold judgments uh, upon the wicked, the battle of Armageddon, the, the saving of all Israel, this remnant uh, that's considered all Israel, that all Israel, uh, at least those who have not been judged, it's going to be a remnant who is going to recognize their Savior. And then... And then there's the preparation of the kingdom, and there's a number of other that you know the sheep, goats judgment. Uh, you have uh, you know the new Jerusalem, the new heavens, new earth, the, uh, all these millennial activities, uh, and and then you know the second coming is Christ's second coming is is ultimately really fulfilled during the millennial age. Uh, the Greek term. Uh, Parousia is it, it means presence, and and ultimately his presence is going to be felt during the millennium. He's going to reign during the millennium. So you have this complexity, especially uh, you know again before the the millennial age. So so coming back to this question, this scene in heaven in Revelation seven nine through seventeen. Uh, I believe that this is a scene, at least the beginning portion of this passage, depicts God's people in heaven before the throne. The throne of the Father is not on earth at this time. Uh, and so, why, in fact, um, what, you know, why why do post tribs in all millennials locate this on earth? Well, I believe it's I don't believe it's well, first of all, I don't believe it's because of exegesis, an exegetical process uh, of how they concluded that. Uh, rather, I think it's a prejudicial hermeneutical lens by which they uh, they have reached that conclusion. Why is it? Again, they have a simple eschatology because what well, what happens in this depiction? What what happens here is well, they believe that you know this this event of you know this enormous crowd, right? They it's made up of many persons, every nation, tribe, people, language. You know, they're before the throne, before the Lamb, dressed in in long white robes and palm branches in their hands, and you know, and they're shouting, salvation belongs to God. Of course, they, they rightly see that this is a deliverance event when Christ returns. Uh, the problem is that amillennialists and post-tribulationists, they do not believe that God's people go to heaven immediately when Jesus returns. Rather, they believe that, you know, we're raptured up to the sky and then immediately we're you know we don't go we don't go before the throne we're up in the sky on the clouds with jesus and then we immediately go come back to earth uh and somehow they kind of collapse uh all of this you know the the heaven coming down to earth at that very moment and the throne coming down at the moment at that moment uh they do not recognize they don't recognize that when Jesus returns to the sky, I'm going to get into this in a moment, he doesn't immediately come down to earth. The, yeah, he, God's people is caught up, the resurrection, the rapture, but he's going to usher them before the throne of the Father in heaven, and then he's going to pour out his wrath on the earth. We're not going to be here for the the... The trumpet and bowl judgments. Uh, I do believe that what well, you know, Christ is going to retrieve the people of God at the very end of God's wrath for the Battle of Armageddon. I believe that we're going to accompany uh, Christ 
into the Battle of, of Armageddon. But that's a whole bit of another issue. Um, and then we're, we're eventually going to come down to Earth. And there's no question about that. We're going to eventually come down to Earth. And uh, in the New Jerusalem that Christ is preparing for us right now. But the, during the that inter, interim of when Christ descends to the the clouds and and at the end of God's wrath, we're going to be in heaven before the throne of the Father. Uh, but post-trips, Amelius can't have that. It contradicts their eschatology because they need a simple eschatology. They need, they need, it needs all to be kind of collapsed. And so what they do is, th this is why they use recapitulation in the trumpet and the bow judgments. They, they, they got to have. They got to try to fit the trumpet. They retroject the trump. The trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments cannot unfold after the seventh seal is opened. And which I I think actually is is a very incoherent and contradictory reading of the narrative. But they they take the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments and they retroject that before uh, this scene or at least kind of collapse all about this at this time. Let me read this text and then i'm gonna I, I believe that are there are good reasons to believe that this passage this scene revelation 7 9 through 17 is picturing a uh, a setting in heaven and not on on earth so revelation chapter 7 verse 9 of course before that you have the 144,000 from all the tribes of the of the people of Israel, uh, they are sealed. I believe that they're sealed because uh, they will actually be physically on earth during the the judgments of God. Uh, but you have this other group in Revelation seven who's going to be protected. Uh, they're going to be protected not on earth. They're be, they're going to, they're going to be protected in heaven uh, during the trumpet and bowl judgments. So Revelation 7 verse 9 says, After these things I looked in, here was an enormous crowd that no one could count, made up of persons from every tribe, people, and nation, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, dressed in long white robes and with palm branches in their hands. They were shouting out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood there in a circle around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they threw themselves down with their faces to the ground before the throne and worshiped God. Saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders asked me, uh, these dressed in white robes, who are they and where have they come from? So I said to him, my Lord, you know the answer. Then he said to me, these are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. And the one seated on the throne will shelter them. They will never go hungry or be thirsty again, and the sun will not beat down on them, nor any burning heat, because the Lamb in the middle of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And then uh, you have the, unfortunately there's chapter breaks. Uh, these are artificial divisions in the text, and very quite uh, misleading because the narrative there's a continuity a semantic continuity here that continues uh, with the now the the seven seal is open now that these two groups of people are are protected now God's judgment can begin and that begins with the opening of the seventh seal which of course opens what it opens up the scroll uh, and very fitting there's silence in heaven for about a half an hour uh, and, and then you have the, the seven trumpet uh, judgments uh, unfold shortly after. Okay, there's good reasons why 
uh, John intends for the, the the scene this the scene of the the great multitude we call it the great multitude or the innumerable multitude why we should see this as a being conceived uh, in heaven above and not on earth well first of all in the immediate context there's a cohesive link with the mention in Revelation 6 16 let me go to Revelation 6 6 uh, 616 so in Revelation 6 uh, 16 it reads they said to the mountains and to the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb okay notice it says uh, the one seated on the throne. Okay, so they're they're they see themselves, or they they see um, uh, the 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 one who seated on the throne and the wrath of the lamb, the Father and the Lamb. Why why is this cohesive tie important? Because as we saw in the text of the great multitude, immediately afterwards, in in Revelation seven, uh, the Father is he he's on the throne. Okay, so you have the setting on the throne, and then here, immediately before it, in the previous context, he, uh, you have this uh, setting the, the Father on the throne. He's seated on the throne. Why is that important? It's because in the sixth seal that begins back in Revelation 12, all right, this is the celestial disturbance, the earthquake, uh, you know, you have the, the huge earthquake took place. The sun became as black as sackcloth made of hair. And, and you know, the moon, uh, full moon became uh, blood red and so forth. Uh, the stars in the sky, right, fell to the earth. Well, and oh, this is key. Uh, verse 14, the sky was split apart. Okay, so the sky, this is the manner, the means by which they can see the Father. The sky, doesn't say the earth was split apart, right? The sky was split apart like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved from its place. All right, then you have the kings of the earth, the very important people, general, the ri generals, rich, powerful. You know, they, they hid themselves in the caves among the rocks, and they said, you know, uh, they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us. Um because they know the wrath of God is about to happen. Well, this is in the context. They're, they're looking up. The, the sixth seal is all about what's taking place uh, in heaven. Yeah, there is a, a, there is a huge earthquake that takes place. But the focus here is on the cosmic uh, disturbances. And there's a connection here between the sky, right, the split apart and being scroll, the, uh, like a scroll being rolled up. All right, and wh what do they see? They see the face of the one who is seated on the throne. This is they're not seeing the face of one seated on the throne on the earth. No, that's that's incoherent. They're they're looking up. They see what is about what is happening. And so the the throne is located in heaven, not on earth. So that's the that's the 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 immediate previous context, uh, and and again, like I said, the, in, in verse fourteen, it the, the scene clearly is established. The setting is in heaven. Uh, verse fourteen, Uranus is a term there. So this this is functioning for this is an apocalyptic event that is revealing the one who is going to judge them. Second, all right, so the immediate context, the previous immediate context, that's setting up the, uh, the it's setting up the, the setting of the, you know, the deliverance of this innumerable multitude is the celestial disturbances, which interestingly, it's linked to Joel 2, 3031, which says it's going to happen before the day of the Lord, not during, not after, but before the day of the Lord. That's one of the reasons, an explicit reason we know that uh, the sixth seal is, is uh, uh, portending the wrath of God. It's about to happen. It's not happening. It hasn't happened just yet. And then you have Revelation 7, 
two groups of people are being delivered and then immediately after uh, the 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 uh, the statements about the throne of God the great multitude they um, they have uh, you know they're wearing white robes and they're before the throne of the Father immediately after this it says uh, immediately after the the deliverance of the innumerable crowd and the execution of God's wrath then is mentions that it happens from heaven in Revelation 8 if you look at Revelation 8 verses 1 to 2 it reads now when the lamb opened the seventh seal there is silence in heaven <laughs> in heaven uh, for about a half an hour then I saw the seven angels who stand before God now, let, me, let me just stop there if God is on earth right if the throne of God is on earth then why is it why is it why is it saying that it's in heaven that makes no sense no the throne of the father is not on earth it's in heaven there are silence in heaven for about in half about a half an hour this um john is seeing the father uh in heaven not on earth the, you can't you can't get more explicit than this i'm sorry all right and then of course if you look at verses three and four three and four this is a depiction of that God's wrath is coming from heaven, okay, uh, from the throne. Uh, verse 3 says, another, another angel holding a golden censer came and was stationed in, at the altar. A large amount of incense was given to him to offer up with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar that is before the throne there it is again before the throne where's the throne not on earth it's explicitly here in heaven and then it says the smoke coming from the incense along with the prayers of the saints ascended before god from the angel's hand you see this is this is very explicit uh, language here saying that the throne is before the father so you you have explicit language before uh the passage about the multitude of the throne of God being in heaven and after the passage uh, about the throne uh, or about the multitude in heaven so before and after this passage it explicitly states that the throne is in heaven this is why all millennialists and post tribulationists have to torture the text and rip it out of its context and retroject it and just put it somewhere else they have to do that they're forced to do that to try to be consistent with their flawed hermeneutic so the source of wrath in this, uh, when the seventh seal is open, you see that the source of wrath is coming from the throne in heaven, uh, with the the downward moving judgments. Okay, it's a downward. If you read the trumpets judgments, is they're they're downward moving uh, trump uh, judgments. It's therefore it's it's an incoherent interpretation to locate the throne on earth with the innumerable multitude in Revelation chapter 7, 9 through uh, 17. Now, eventually, don't get me wrong, eventually, uh, heaven is going to coalesce. Uh, that is, the new, this new Jerusalem is going to coalesce. It's going to come down uh, or for the millennium. And eventually it will. Uh, in fact, if you, you, know, if you, you can go to... Um, well, let me actually... Uh, let, me, let me just mention and again if when you go to revelation you know 21 and 22 you can you can see that coalescing now post tribulationists and amillennialists still point to revelation 7 17 and they'll say well look at look at this is this has got to be on earth because it says be because the lamb in the middle of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to springs of living water and god will wipe away every tear from their eyes uh, and they'll look at Revelation 7, 16 as well. They will never go hungry to be thirst again, and, and the sun will not beat down on them, nor any burning heat. Well, this is, this is 
talking about the re, uh, the the ultimate result, um, the the eternal comfort that they will experience. So yeah, eventually they will be on earth. But if you notice here, the language here is indicating uh, that they're indicating their long term their long term state. And so, yeah, uh, the springs of living water and so forth. Of course, I think post trips and and out, especially uh, all millennialists wouldn't even look at this more as literal language. I do believe that there's going to be literal springs of living water, but that's a whole other uh, topic. Uh, so this passage toward the end here, yeah, it, it talks about eventually their their earthly comfort and their their. Um, uh, their comfort from the Father. But the beginning of this passage, though, where they have just come out, notice they have just come out of the Great Tribulation. This is depicting their immediate state. Okay, their immediate situation here. Uh, they are before the throne of Father. And it is then eventually, of course, they will coalesce uh, to... Uh, the New Jerusalem to the earth, and we you see that explicitly in uh, Revelation uh, twenty one uh, and and and, and twenty two. So there's two other uh, passages uh, in the New Testament that uh, indicate that the that when Jesus returns, immediately we will be caught up and we'll be, we'll be ushered before the throne of the Father in heaven. We're not going to immediately come back to, to earth. And that is, uh, I have an article here at uh, my website, alankirshner.com. There is, uh, if you go to my website, in the right-hand column, there is a link. I have you got to scroll down a little bit. There's highlighted links, and one of these links is it says replies to post trib. So if you know any post tribbers, you can send them this uh, this uh, this page full of links of articles that have written over the years that I think a, a lot of post tribs have just simply not considered, uh, and. One of these articles, let me click on, uh, let's see here, where is it? Um, it is, oh, here, okay, here we go. I think it's the last one here. Uh, actually, there's, there is, um, no, where is it? Oh, okay, right in front of me. Uh, where do believers go after the rapture? All right, so this article is, there are, uh, you know, of course, the question is, where do, where do believers go after the rapture, right? We're, we're caught up to in the sky with the Lord. Uh, do we immediately descend to earth or are we ushered before the throne of the Father? And you can see here a chart. Uh, of course, those who are listening by audio won't be able to see the chart, but I will link uh this uh, I'll post this link in the show notes and you can see the chart uh, I'll link it in the, uh, the show notes okay so there is uh, there's two passages I want to highlight here and the first is is second uh, Corinthians 414 so this passage here says we do <clears throat> we do so because we know that the one who raised up Jesus will also raise us up resurrection with Jesus and will bring us with you into his, that is the Father's presence. 2 Corinthians 4.14 4. uh, Okay, so some some might object and say, well, that, that doesn't really explicitly indicate uh, the, you know, uh, in heaven. Well, actually, if you look at the the the, the context here, uh, Jesus, there there's no the, first of all, there's no indication here that that Paul is talking about the Father's presence is on earth. Uh, 
In fact, he makes this quite uh, explicit in the next passage in John 14, 2 to 3. Uh, where it says, there are many dwelling places in my father's house. Where is the house? It's in heaven, right? And his audience knows it's not on earth, it's in heaven. He says, otherwise I would have told you because I am going away. I am going away. Where's Jesus going? He's going to the father. Where, where, where is he going away to the father? In heaven, right? To make ready a place for you. That would be the new Jerusalem. And if I go and make ready a place for you that is in heaven, making the new Jerusalem, preparing it, I will come again and take you to be with me so that where I am, that is heaven, not earth, you may be too. Okay, there it is. Uh, that is showing that Jesus is going to take his bride uh, to heaven when he returns. So that's a very important uh, passage. So, um, and there's another passage, Isaiah 26, 19 through 21, although it, it doesn't explicitly say it's whether in, in, it's in heaven or on earth, but I, I will have a program just on this passage because there's, a, there's an interesting term uh, in this passage that may suggest, uh, that may suggest heaven. Okay, so, so basically, yeah, these, these passages, including, of course, the other passage here is what we address in Revelation uh, chapter 7 verses 13 through 15, they, they, they picture the Lord escorting believers into the presence of the Father, that is heaven. The Lord will mete out his eschatological wrath upon the ungodly on earth, but the church will not remain, or God's people will not remain in heaven because the new Jerusalem will eventually then, eventually descend to earth. We're not going to be in heaven, in the sky, somewhere out there uh, for eternity, but rather we're, we're going to be here uh, for the, the new earth, for the millennium and eternity. Uh, I hope that's been helpful. Uh, you can go to alankirshner.com. If you guys are new, any, uh, any of you are new to uh, pre-wrath eschatology or eschatos ministries, uh, we've, we've got a number of resources. We've got a, a great documentary uh, called Seven Preacher Problems in the Pre-Wrath Rapture. Uh, you can you can watch that for free uh, on YouTube. Uh, we also have DVDs and uh, thumb drives for that as well. Uh, I have a book, Antichrist Before the Day of Lord, and then uh, what every Christian sh needs to know about the return of Christ, and you know some audio as well, programs, uh, a sh some down version of my book, Pre Wrath: A Very Short Introduction to the Great Tribulation Rapture and the Day of the Lord. Uh, also, you know, if you want to uh, support the ministry, Eschatos Ministries, uh, you can do so. Uh, you can become an Eschatos partner. You can just go up alankirshner.com, click on partner, and you can sign up. Uh, you can also do one one time gift, uh, one time gifts as well. And if you become a partner, by the way, that's again uh, supporting us on a monthly basis. You can. Uh, there's benefits to it. Uh, 100 discount free, free, all electronic. You can download all the electronic products for free. Uh, and you can, um, in fact, you know, I don't even have that here. I need to add this here. Uh, we're we're going to be having a forthcoming uh, magazine, a, a print magazine and online version, the same thing. Uh, and you will be sent this magazine uh, as well for free. And any future books that are published through our imprint, Eschatos Publishing, you will receive as uh, for free as long as you remain an active uh, partner. Okay. Hey, guys. Uh, I hope that's been helpful. And again, you know, this is the, the, the first episode of the Biblical Prophecy Program that we are bringing in a uh, a video feature to the podcast so i hope that's been helpful and over time i'm going to be incorporating more more of these features so uh, all right thank you for for listening and and watching